I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's very nice to be with you this morning. My name is Ross Cain. I teach ethics and theology at Virginia Theological Seminary, where I also run the doctoral programs. Before going to VTS, I served as a parish priest in this diocese, so it's a special pleasure to be with you here at Grace. I'd like to talk about this passage in Ephesians that uh, we have this morning, in particular this sentence, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Knowledge is power. It's a phrase we all know. I remember growing up in school, I was often told that as a kind of motivator to make me study. Um, I had a teacher in the sixth grade, she was my sixth grade history teacher, who said this probably at least once a week. Knowledge is power. And it was often in response to, you know, cynical sixth graders, never me. Um, uh, cynical sixth graders said, why do we study history? Why don't we talk about what's going on in the world today? And she'd always say, knowledge is power. And the idea, again, was to motivate us because the better we know the world, so was the idea, the more power we would have to navigate it and indeed to influence it. Now, the virtue of this phrase is clear enough. I think we'd all agree, at least as Episcopalians, that knowledge is better than ignorance. And there are times in our lives when knowledge opens a way to us that we wouldn't necessarily see before. Those kind of light bulb moments, right? We have some problem in life and then we, we see something and suddenly a way is opened that we hadn't expected. Or think in the spiritual traditions of Christianity, this, this long theme of knowledge is illumination, this, this lighting up of certain areas of knowledge in our souls. And it's only through that illumination and that knowledge that we're able to achieve a greater bonding with Christ himself. So the virtue of the phrase is clear enough. But knowledge is power. There's also a kind of cautionary sense to the phrase as well. For knowledge not only has the power to heal in the sense of illumination, but surely knowledge has the power to destroy in the physical world, it's obvious enough, and those who saw the movie Oppenheimer saw, I think, in, in, in vivid portraiture, the way that knowledge, human knowledge of the physical world can not only destroy cities, but even the very world itself. There's also knowledge that is the power to dominate. Among philosophers like Michel Foucault, We've learned that much of racism and colonialism is not just about physical power as much as it's about those things, but also the power to organize knowledge. That racism and colonialism thrived on this organization of knowledge that said, oh, these people should be viewed in this way and those other people should be viewed in another way. And of course, we all live in the DC area here and isn't access to knowledge often so crucial to power? within Washington. So knowledge is power. There are virtues to this fact, and there are also cautions. Now, these themes of power and knowledge come up in this reading from Ephesians as well. Now, it might be easy to miss amid the Pauline run-on sentence. You know, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes these Pauline run-on sentences, my eyes sort of glaze over after a little bit. But, but check this out. I pray, says the Pauline writer, that you may have the power to comprehend. So already there's power and knowledge there. With all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So here first, this phrase, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints. There's a sense that comprehension, spiritual knowledge, is not an individual thing, but actually a communal undertaking. That as we know things in the spiritual life, the things that we discover 
through one another, never just on our own. And you know, when it says to know with all the saints, we have this image of saints as these really wonderful people who have lived in the past. But for the New Testament writers, saints were holy people that are just around us, people that we experience in our everyday lives. So knowledge comes by way of ordinary people that we know in the pews, that we know in our workplace, that we know in school. We discover something about God with the saints, not on our own. We come to spiritual knowledge together. We only comprehend God and God's work in the world through one another. Next week in the lectionary, we get the next little bit from Ephesians, and that really breaks this down well. It talks about the body of Christ, all of us growing into this body that is Christ. Christ is the head of the body, but all of us are members of this body growing into Jesus. And there's, you know, what the Pauline writer is saying here is nothing short of all of us are a little piece of Jesus. Jesus Christ is alive in and through us, but not just through us individuals. It's actually through us together as a community that Christ exists in the world today. And so this passage talks about that in terms of knowledge. I know something about God and Christ, yes, but I only know it with others. I only discover it through encounters with other members of the body of Christ. And it's only together that we can know God. Now, especially when knowledge is held individually, it can easily veer towards a desire for mastery. Not that we ever see that in seminary education, trying to master knowledge. But when, when knowledge is communal, that actually means it's not just about me and what I know. It's not just about you and what you know. It's about what we know and how we experience God together. When knowledge requires our interdependence, that undercuts our own desire to use knowledge as a means of mastery. So that's the first theme about knowledge in this passage, is that knowledge of God is communal and it's found through one another. But the passage then goes a step further. This, it's a run-on sentence after all. So this run-on sentence gives us yet another perspective on knowledge. It asks that we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Now surely that's an odd phrase. They're asking us to know something that surpasses knowledge. We're supposed to know something that you can't actually know. Okay. But what is it that we know? To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It is love that's the thing that we know, and it is that that makes all the difference. Knowledge is power, okay, but however much power we may get from knowledge, love surpasses it. There is a funky little book written by uh, an unknown author in the medieval mystical tradition called The Cloud of Unknowing. The book is as cool as the title, The Cloud of Unknowing. And the writer in The Cloud of Unknowing says this, by our love, the divine may be reached and held. By our thinking, never. Now I confess that's a hard sentence for a seminary professor, uh, trying to keep my job over here, but <laughs> listen to it again. By our love, the divine may be reached and held. By our thinking, never. Now this isn't to undercut knowledge entirely. The whole reason the author wrote the book, The Cloud of Unknowing, is so that we would know something that we then have to unknow. But knowledge is a part of it. You see, knowledge will get us part of the way to God, 
It will assist us in our journey to God, but it will never get us there fully. For only love can do that. And in this sentence, in the cloud of unknowing, the author says that with love, we can not only reach for the divine, but we can even hold the divine. So knowledge, knowing things about God, might get us closer to seeing and comprehending the divine, but only love will let us hold it. Because when we encounter love, we are encountering God's very self. Something that we cannot say of knowledge. We say as Christians, God is love. But we don't say God is knowledge. Now this is a genuine temptation in our current life and politics and economy, that this temptation of the quote-unquote knowledge economy is to make knowledge into something that's like unto a God. But as Christians, we say God is love, not God is knowledge. Knowledge may prepare the way for getting us closer to God, but ultimately it's always love that actually gets us to God. And that love can be experienced in all sorts of ways. We often think of the dramatic moments when love comes through in our lives in ways that we didn't expect. But I think ultimately the spiritual life is actually sustained by those very ordinary moments of love each and every day. The loving kindness of a friend or a family member. Perhaps the love that we sense in the deepest parts of ourselves in moments of prayer and meditation. The love that we experience when someone shows us some kindness that we simply didn't deserve. All of that is the experience of God and God's very self. And here again, we see what love does versus what knowledge does. Knowing that these experiences of love are experiences of God makes a profound difference, even a life-changing difference. But still, ultimately that knowledge is not the experience of God. It's always ultimately love that is God in God's self. Knowledge is power, yes, but as we see in Ephesians, that can't be the end of the story. Knowledge is not for mastery, nor is it for dominating others. Knowledge, rather, knowledge of God is communal, always learned in, with, and through others, our fellow members in the body of Christ. And knowledge should always ever lead us towards love. For where we are experiencing love, there indeed we are experiencing God. Amen.